thank you for being with us here at OLC Live. And um, we've got another interview here at 10 a.m. with a good friend of mine and colleague. And um, he's at Michigan State University and he teaches science. And his name is Dr. Stephen Thomas. And um, Stephen, hello. Hello. Thank <laughs> you for having me. <laughs> So um, I know you were here last year at OLC Innovate. That's right. And you were involved in the Solutions Design Summit. That's right. And this year, um, you are here, and I, I, you were like involved, I believe, in five or six. No, it was just four. It was four. Four? Yes. Yes. Okay. Four presentations. Maybe we actually ran the gamut. It was like a conversation, not a presentation, and uh -huh. a. Uh, modified poster and um, a five minute talk on failure. That was my favorite. And uh, yeah, I heard great things and I didn't get to see it. Oh, well, I have to say, so when I first got the email, I was like, I just skimmed it. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm so, that's exciting. I've been asked to give a talk. And then I just saw the words, can you talk on personal failure? And I was like, <laughs> I was, I'm so glad someone thinks I'm an expert on personal failure and I would love to talk more <laughs> about that. Uh, but yeah, so it was actually really fun to, to do that. It was good. Oh, so. man. Yeah. Can I, can I ask about that? Yeah. Like yeah totally. talked about? Oh yeah. Um, so in my science course, um, we're trying to teach K-12 teachers about uh, science. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the last science course that they have before they go into the classroom. Okay. And uh, one of the things that we try to do is to get them to experience kind of what science is in the broad sense, because uh, typically science courses, unfortunately, a lot of times follow kind of a cookbook feel. And so you go in, everything that you need to do is laid out. You do the steps, you get the, either you get the data and you might interpret that. But it, basically, you're just trying to... Um, Everything is designed to prove your hypothesis. And you don't get experience in um, developing questions or forming hypotheses or, you know, why would you state your hypothesis as null hypothesis? Or why would you, um, like, how would you control for variables? Those kinds of things aren't necessarily thought about. And so we think that if you're going to be a future teacher of science, that you might should experience the entirety of the experience and so the story was actually about um, a student I had who when their experiment failed um, they were really distraught and you know I tried to say you know look your grades not based on getting significant results you it's based on your thinking process yes. <clears throat> so I was like this is this is great this is okay you can actually just now try to tease apart like why it didn't work and they were like no I'm done Hmm. And I was like, I don't know what that means. Like, <laughs> I didn't know that was an option to begin with. <laughs> and two, like, you know, what does that actually entail? And yeah. uh, what I found out is what that meant is the next day they brought in a, a f like a fully baked kind of experiment that you normally do in K-12 settings. And they just ran that experiment, collected the data, and the results came out perfect, right? And so I thought what was interesting is that it's our definitions of failure and success. So for the yeah. student, success meant getting uh, getting perfect data and an A. And for me, success looked like actually failing and then teasing that apart. Oh yeah. Right? And yeah. so it just made me like wonder like how many times do we actually think that we're succeeding when really we're not, getting out of it what we should be getting out of it. And so it was just basically asking a question, like at what point do you uh, kind of self-evaluate your successes and failures? I think sometimes we just kind of perseverate on the, the failures piece, but honestly, like a lot of times the things that we think are successes may not be actually that, mm. what we should have gotten out of it. So, oh, snap. Yeah. yeah. So. That was so, what that was about. So by ch choosing the more clearly anticipated successful route, that was the biggest failure of all. Right. And that, 
Well, right. And this, yeah. I think what's interesting is also this dichotomy of, you know, we either put something in one of these bins or the other, as yeah. opposed to like, you know, it's really more nuanced of being like, you know, it did help progress me in this way, but really I could have, you know, developed it a little bit more and gotten something completely different out of it. Yeah. So, so would you say that's a, a lot of your work as an educator of science of, I mean, that particular narrative of helping students um, realize that the scientific method actually gravitate, if gravitates, is always intended to gravitate toward figuring out if it fails. Yes, right. Like, uh, there's, a, there's an article that I, I give students a lot of times, which is about um, the feeling of stupidity in science mm -hmm. and how you, uh, in many ways, if you're going to do science or be a scientist, you have to be comfortable with um, being in like not knowing. So yes. a lot of times we present science as just being this fact laden thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're, you're kind of a holder of facts as opposed to a person who feels comfortable wrestling in the unknown. Right. And sometimes those two things seem really antagonistic and, um, and I, right, I think sometimes that leads to students not even knowing really what science is, even if you're engaged in science. Like, I don't think I understood, think, I don't think I had a really good understanding of science. I knew I liked it, uh, maybe even through grad school. Maybe even after grad school did I understand, like, really what I was shooting for. I was just really on the treadmill, you know, and going through, like, oh, I like this topic. I like learning about it. But kind of the bigger picture of science philosophy and those kinds of things came much later than I would have expected. But mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Well, let's talk about that a little oh, yeah. bit because um, I know we were supposed to be talking about like active learning. <laughs> um, yes, bring and, it on. <laughs> um, I don't know if I've, we've ever talked about this, oh. but um, you know that I started off teaching high school science. Totally. And, um, that was a two year endeavor of many, many days of feeling like a complete failure. Uh -huh. Some days of triumphant success. Right. But, that resonates with me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, I certainly, um, it, as much as I had experienced, I guess you could say like transformative learning experiences in preparing to become an educator around problem based learning and um, active learning environments. I found that implementing them um, in my classroom were really difficult to pull off and it was it was a lot easier. I it was very easy for me to just gravitate toward back to a lecture. Right. Um, and, um, and in many cases where I was at that was what they were expecting of me. Right. Um, and act implementing active learning was really asking them to, uh, my students to be involved in the learning process in ways that they hadn't been asked to totally. before. And it, um, so there's, there's a lot there, but it, all that to say, like, it's been an evolution of learning how to, and I'm far from getting it, but like learning how to implement active learning strategies in ways uh, that, um, are sensitive to people's experiences um, coming into it, where this might be a new thing right. that I'm asking of them. Yeah. So it's been a learning process for yeah. me as an educator. I, all this, I'm curious for you, you've been teaching for a long time. But it, yes. Have you yeah. experienced a similar evolution or, or did you come right out of the gate teaching with these no. phenomenal active no. strategies? No, I was terrible. Uh, <laughs> I was terrible on a lot of fronts. I think one, I started off just very robotic because it was like, um, it was almost like putting on a persona. And then I think once I got felt comfortable just being in the classroom and being like, uh, cause I'm goofy and I also like run into things and like, it's like a, it's like a physical comedy routine. Like I've, I've done many a thing. I warn students ahead of time, be prepared. I'm very sturdy though. So I'll get back up and you like, you won't, you, nothing will be wrong. Just don't be surprised when it happens. 
<laughs> but I think what has been really helpful for me is the online move. So back in 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. um, I started teaching online and um, that shift was actually really freeing because there was no, there was no format of what this is what online learning looks like. Yeah. You could create anything and that was the appeal of it. And, and also this kind of beginning of the journey into like, how do you engage students? And so probably like three years into it, four years, um, I had this epiphany that online learning was online reporting, not online doing. And Ooh. that was like the moment where I was like, oh, okay, I can do lots of things. And so like I have an ecology course that I teach online. And uh, one of the things I had them do was to go out and find a plot of land. And then every week when, um, when we would talk theories, I would have them go out and do an exercise that kind of has them experience that theory in one of their localized habitats. And so the idea is that it, you know, potentially uh, connects it to their environment and it personalizes it and maybe makes it authentic. And, um, right. And so then it, it just kind of opened the door to, you know, thinking about things differently. So like, how do you turn things more active? Right. And so, um, Another thing that we thought about was like videos, like Planet Earth clips, like those were just like gold. Yeah. But right when you watch them, you're just like, ah, oh, yes, I'm just gonna let this wash over me, which is great, but it actually is not necessarily the most active of experiences. Yeah. And so um, we turned off the sound. Ooh. And so it's interesting how just that one piece and asking them a question of like, what is the relationship between these fish and these snakes? And all of a sudden you're trying to like interpret and you're doing observation and it becomes like oh, a word. I was That's brilliant. Like, well, cause you no, you're taking away the, the direct instruction. Right. That's complementing the imagery. And by taking that away, you have to use your mind to observe and make guesses as to what's happening. Totally. Which and, is much yeah. more active. Right. And so it was kind of like this thought of like, how do you take I mean, even like more passive things and make them more active, even though the passive things were very satisfying at the yeah. time. Right. But it was interesting because at oh. times there would be, I'd forget to tell them actually what the answer was. And so I'd have people in the <laughs> chat form being, what is the relationship between these two things? But you, you, uh, uh, they were interested to, yeah. to know. Yeah. And angry. <laughs> Who doesn't like an angry student group, right? <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, I think what was interesting that also is raised the question for me is when you do have an active classroom in your lecture and, you know, or in your lecture or in your, you know, um, what is the role of labs? Mm -hmm. So, um, one of my uh, TAs who then took a similar class in Delaware he had emailed me and he said, um, I've just got the highest compliment from a student because the student asked, how come I'm not getting lab credit for this course? And I was like, oh. right? And that just it begs the question oh, wow. of yeah, like, yeah. when you make an active classroom oh, and you're engaging them in actively doing science or thinking about it, really, what is the difference between a lab class and a lecture class? And oh, wow. yeah, I still haven't figured that one out, <laughs> yeah. but I think it's an interesting question of like, for sure, what, you know, is that a di dichotomy that lives mostly in a traditional, um, in that traditional format, right. you know, or is it a thing about resources or, you know, I mean, there are good reasons for doing these kinds of separations, but maybe some of it is artificial. And you've transitioned as an educator from, from um, implementing these active learning strategies in your courses. Your role today has also been ex expanded upon by you've been helping other colleges and other faculty. Um, you've been walking with them through uh, this journey of uh, learning around implementing active learning into their own 
classroom learning environments. Right. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? That's been interesting. It's um, it runs the gamut. So we have people who, you know, don't actually think of or maybe haven't considered active learning as being a piece of what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Right. So in some ways it's um, they're more of a traditional lecturing uh, style faculty. And um, I don't know that the question's actually been raised to them or right. And so in many ways, there's a lot of convincing that this is um, one of use and two, that they're not going to lose so much content. Right. So yeah. like that's the trade off. It's often, yeah. you know, it's an either or phenomenon, although I'm not sure that that's actually a clear right trade off, but um, right. So who are afraid of that, but then there are others who are just incredibly thoughtful and stump me. And I have no idea how, I like I can't answer them like so what they want to do is recreate the social aspects of group activities oh, yeah. online yeah and um and what they want to capture is the overheard aspects of you know whereas a group working on here and when they're of a group of you know and just the random like interactions that go on not necessarily in the group but between groups Mm. and um and they want to do it synchronous they they think the value is in, is in the synchronicity of it mm -hmm. and it's um you know like when they lay out all these variables you're like oh i <laughs> i don't know that i can that we can recreate that exact right. experience and um right that's a hard one yeah because you're absolutely uh you know you're always trying to figure out the solution and the, how do you please and how do you um i think we like to think that technology can do most things if it's applied in a creative way and and then just sometimes you're just like i don't i i'm afraid that you'll have to go with second best on that mm -hmm. and that's that's a hard yeah it's kind of a hard pill yeah 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 so yeah sure well steven thank you for talking with us is there something else you wanted to um no, I, well, I was just going to say that um, one of the talks I gave yeah. at the session was on drawing. Oh yeah, yeah. as a <laughs> as a method. Which is another thing you do. Uh, you are a graphic illustrator. Um, you are, and very good one at that. Um, Thank you. Um, but what I like to think is that I came to it really late in life. About um, now, if I don't have a whiteboard in front of me at all times, I'm just like itching and being like, I don't know how to like represent what I want to say and um but what i was thinking about this is a question that i have and anyone out there listening who can help shed some light on it is thinking about the active aspects of note taking or like how do we ask students to engage with things that are like lectures or um i'm starting to like wonder like how do we foster students interactions with the materials where they're uh, creating artifacts that also help with their learning because I'm afraid that most of my students are just engaging with the materials and being like oh I can come back and listen to that again or like I don't need to make physical mm. notes or synthesize them in a way outside of the activities right so the actual processing of the information and so what I'm afraid is that they're losing out on this Thing that I also feel like I wasn't trained in or thought about, which is how do I use drawing or note taking as my mental process, which is part of my professional activities, yeah. right? And yeah. so, um, just tossing that out. If you're out there, please contact me about thoughts or ideas you have on that, because I would love to know how we should be thinking about the active part of mental model making you know through the use of notes or drawings or any kind of thing like that so yeah and help um, me i just gotta say uh you should take steven up on that offer because i i find him to be one of the that, best how do you stop there <laughs> i know and um thank you it's it's a blast to collaborate with you and learn from you and with you and back at you. 
and um, yeah, we've got another interview coming up with another uh, person from Michigan State University, Jessica Knott. Wonderful and colleague. Angela Gunder and um, wonderful collaborator. Others around the monomyth. We're going to try to actually jump over to their session, I think, and catch a, a bit of it. And then uh, after their session, we're coming back here and John Stewart's going to interview them right after they've done their session perfect so that's kind of where we're headed and after that we're gonna we're gonna kind of wrap things up uh john and i will talk about uh do a little reflection together briefly about uh this experiment that we've been doing um this i would say in some ways active learning experiment we've been doing here within the conference and would love love to have uh, anybody participating and talking with us and reflecting with us uh, starting at 11:45 for that. Um, but we're gonna pause things here, and we'll we'll be back. Uh, it looks like at 11 a.m. We'll flip things back on. So we'll see you soon. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you all. <laughs>